Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, uh, wherever you're located. I see we have uh, many participants have joined us, and uh, many more are joining us every second. So we'll wait a, a few more seconds before uh, we formally get started. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm Roger Struckoff. I'm the Editor-in-Chief and Director of Research at uh, IDCA. And today we allegedly are going to speak about operational excellence in data centers. And we're going to cover that from very low uh, technical and detailed operational level all the way up to strategy and everything in between because we think it's a critical component of everyone's job in the industry today is to, is to see the whole picture. I won't formally introduce the panelists. Uh, if you registered for this, you see their names and titles and experience um, on the registration page. And we welcome everybody for uh, speaking today. Thank you very much. We welcome everybody for attending and, and watching this. And we hope to offer you an interesting discussion. A note is that we will take a break at the half hour for about five minutes. And it will be only about five minutes, but it lets you get up and walk around, do what you got to do, and then we'll be back. But since we have so much to talk about, we actually do not have a hard stop at the top of the hour. So we may run a little bit long. And by that, I mean 10 or so minutes, run a little bit long. And if that's a problem for any of the viewers, um, sorry about that. If you got to go, you got to go. However, we're recording this and you will have a link to the entire webinar. So you're not going to miss a thing. So with that said, uh, let's start out with Decron, who works uh, with IDCA, and he teaches our, our main instructor for a lot of courses. He's been in this industry for a long time, as you can tell by, by the color of his beard, as he was saying. He's been here for a long time. He teaches a lot of things. And we have a couple of slides. If we could run the first slide about components. And uh, Decron, if you could just tell us, give us the overview of when you are operating a data center, what do you have to worry about? Well, good morning, everyone, uh, panelists and attendees. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, well, you know, uh, when we talk about data centers, um, everybody agrees that it's a complex beast. It's not something that uh, it's that easy to manage. Definitely, you need to have a lot of, a lot of you know, discipline in in doing so in managing the data center. So, um, I would say. You have so many different things that play in when uh, you're operating a data center. First thing, let's put it like as a priority, the HR, the quality of people that you're dealing with, because the data center runs as well as the people that are managing it, right? So today, everybody agrees we have a big scarcity um, of people qualified, skilled enough to be introduced in a data center space. That's one, uh, one problem that we face and all the data center um, operators are facing that. The second thing I would say could be compliance, because today, if you don't comply, uh, things will not really run smoothly. Today, uh, I always give the example, like uh, the aviation industry is one of the industries that are that is um, uh, very well, you know, um, uh, performing. And, you know, uh, air accidents are minimum. We have 120,000 flights that are taking off and landing every day. And, um, all you know, it's very safe. Why is it very safe? Because... Uh, they're using very stringent standards from the manufacturer of planes, from the, the pilots, the control towers, uh, the ground people, the crew members. Everyone is trained. Everyone is disciplined. Everyone is following a certain stringent policies and procedures that makes it really a safe industry. The data center is not really uh, uh, less than the aviation industry. It's really risky. We're dealing with megawatts of power. We're dealing with a lot of complex equipment. Yes, uh, you're saying something, Raj. Well, I was thinking, how does this compare to, say, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Um, I, I think operational excellence and safety has probably improved. Yeah, definitely. So um, as as the data centers are becoming more dense today, the density is increasing on every day exponentially, I would say. And that brings us to uh, one thing is that the, you, the error that you had in the past, let's let's say like 10, 10 years ago or 20 years ago on one rack, 
uh, with the consequences that it may lead to, like losing the business, losing the data, whatever it was back then, with the densities that are increasing today, that will be even more severe. So basically, you're you need to you need to work on the human capital to make sure the uh, you know all that uh, problems that uh, you know the human errors are are not occurring. That's another uh, challenge. Another challenge would be risk management mitigation. Another challenge would be you know capacity management. You know you remember Chris when you were in Expedia. That, that was a hell of a problem. I mean, managing the capacities, you know, what, what is, uh, uh, rather than focusing on my application delivery, I'm worried about what my UPS capacity is, which my, what is my carrier capacity, what is my, you know, CPU capacity and UPS and generator. I want to just focus on delivering my application. Yet you have a lot of things that are, you know, related to the capacity management. Uh, monitoring, DCIM, is another major challenge today. I mean, having... Having the visual, having the how you see your data center in front of you, and today as the data centers are becoming more complex, I think the DCIM alone, as a DCIM, will not be able to you know manage everything unless you're introducing machine learning, AI, you know, taking action like when you when you receive a, a high temperature alarm before a human being intervenes, the the computers intervene automatically, the AI intervenes and change you know set points. Uh, Efficiency gains, how you can gain your efficiency without having the AI integrated, DCIM, lifecycle management, so many things, uh, Roger, is so complex. So each each of these people, <laughs> give us an hour exactly that. So in a few minutes, we went from low to high. Chris, is, what is he saying? Um, uh, if everything he said, what was true? And is there anything that you would dispute? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, obviously, <laughs> Dick Rand is a, a, a man of many words, but... Uh, totally wise in, in what he's talking about as far as capacity management, yeah. uh, DCIM, safety security. I think uh, everybody's top of mind right now is AI and how do we leverage that uh, to, to make the world a better place, to make the data center a safer place. Uh, so so definitely he's spot on. Okay, uh, Laurie, when we were, we were speaking a little bit before we got started here, and we started talking about DCIM and we talked about integrating AI into that. And I think you have some opinions about that. No, I never have opinions. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I, I guess I misunderstood. Right. Yeah, there was there was so much in what, what Dikron said that is like so true, right? That ties together different threads, right? And like AI ops is great, right? That's what the market is calling it. And that's wonderful. And it's gonna help drive a lot of change in operations but it's not as safe without a lot of standards, right? You understand the procedures. You don't just let an, an AI go, well, I think that's that's good, right? It hallucinates and the next thing you know, you know, half your business is gone, right? It's so, <laughs> right. I, you, you, I, so I, I it, that from the GPT, yes. just my little experience. You, right. Describe that a little bit, what do you mean by that though? Uh, <laughs> well, when you, in generative AI, hallucinations are what because right this the system is actually just generating what's the next likeliest word right it's not actually thinking it's not actually answering your yeah. question it's just generating right what it thinks is the right next word in right. traditional AI it could be right pulling together the wrong data um, or right the data isn't complete. So it's making an inference based on incomplete data or biased data. So it makes the wrong decision. Same kind of concept. So standards, right? Uh, policies, procedures, right? Having something very clear that you can basically use AI more for you know, operations, for pulling out those insights you know exist between data points and then driving things is going to be safer to free up those other people to be able to do more high value work, like strategic work. I'm thinking in, in events um, like this with so many people and moving quickly, maybe I'm a generative AI. I'm just thinking of what's the next word that I need to say rather than actually thinking. Carl, if we go back to um, what Dikran was just saying, operationally, what sort of complexity do you face? As I understand it, you're responsible for data centers across quite a large region in, in Europe for uh, quite a substantial company. What are these challenges, complex challenges that you face? What would they be? Uh, mainly, it's just uh, just trying to understand. You know, in short, we work in many different colos. So 
different colos or different data center spaces uh, all have different rules and regulations. So from that point of view, most of uh, or a lot of my work goes into just trying to understand exactly how everyone works and trying to get that into a format internally, which uh, which is very, you know, in a similar language for everyone to understand that, that fits in with with what we've right. already got within our own spaces. Um, and yeah, trying to um, just but you're, get everything you're, in the same yeah. language, basically. And but you're working through through many countries that have quite a diverse range, I think, of bandwidth and capacity and, and maybe even sizes of the data centers, you know, without saying anything that you can't say. Um, is that what kind of challenges does that present to you from working in sort of diverse environments like that? Um, what I will say about the data center industry now is luckily for us, a majority of data centers are well designed. Mm -hmm. So actually finding places to at least look at is is quite easy nowadays um mm -hmm. most most markets are fairly mature across well i cover emea so um, a majority of our places are are fairly mature now so actually finding places to um to, to go and look at and you know at least review isn't isn't such a such of an issue but we yeah. aren't you know we are we're getting into nitpicky type uh you know who's you know who's got the the most small issues right okay. you know and it, it can come from any area you know it, it can yeah. come from a security standpoint or from a, a facilities right. or you know or, or a, a data communications point is right. probably our largest uh Concern. yeah right. at the moment yeah at, just, at the, just moment. the connectivity yeah. to the world from right. all that local geographic location sure. is probably our our, our biggest uh, issue that, uh, that this this it's our need for, well, for that. What I'm thinking is maybe the bad old days weren't so bad. You know, we always live in the present. We always think we're modern. They thought they were modern in the eighth century, for example. But Keith, um, you you know were there in the earlier days, and as I understand it, I was reading your tweets a few years ago. This is something I'm just fixated on this journey that you took uh, that you've been taking over the last few years and sort of building your own center and learning and then applying that to your work with people. Could you take us through that journey? You're mute. You're on mute. Let me unmute myself. I'm sure I'm my age, by the way. So I, I, the, you can't see the gray as much. Well, I see a little uh, bit. Yeah. Oh no, it's 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 heavy. It's, it's a very dark room. <laughs> so the uh, just piggybacking on what everyone has yeah. said, the uh, yeah. what we identified a, a few years ago is some a truth that everyone on this webinar panel already knows. Nothing ever dies in the data center, in the enterprise data center. We we don't retire stuff. We accumulate more and more systems. It's funny enough. The data center that we're in now, the cage next to me, have a bunch of beige machines. If you've seen a beige machine uh, ever in your career, you're like, those things are gone. The simple fact is they don't go away. Uh, I had the luxury or pleasure of interviewing for a position at Comcast a few years ago in which I was uh, destined to lead the OpenStack team before. Before the team even finished the interview process, that entire team migrated to Walmart. Talent is the number one problem facing the customers I talk to because of this diversity of environments. So what we did, uh, it's gone on, uh, I think, three or four years now, uh, four years because I'm in my second data center, Colo contract is that we said, hey, we're going to document the journey. We're going to take a five-year-old pod and we're going to modernize that pod. We're going to walk this journey that customers are walking to say, we're going to uh, both have a traditional data center running VMware vSphere, some legacy applications, and combine that with this modernized approach of cloud, well, at the time, cloud first, and combine the two because we know, and as we've seen now, what's been proved out in the past few months, 
the cloud is not the final destination for most companies. It's going to be a combination of private data center assets, colo assets, in the public cloud. And we wanted to mimic that journey by creating a five-year-old pod and then modernizing it with upgrading networking, storage, compute, and connecting that to the public cloud. And that's what we've done for the past four years. Okay. Now we mentioned, so for the past 10 years, um, I've been at, um, headed a lot of events and I do a lot of research. And for the last 10 years, I've been hearing about edge computing and how this is going to take over. But the experience that I think people are having, and um, I actually had a another consultant who's not with us today, but just tell me last week, no, we're headed the other direction. We're continuing to to become bigger and bigger and densities are becoming thicker and thicker. Uh, Decron, could you speak to that a little bit? You started out, uh, you mentioned densities. I mean, we're going to places in terms of square footage density and then also the total number of megawatts that are required. It seems like we're just on this track that keeps getting bigger. Well, it's um, it's exponentially growing as well. I mean, from what we've seen, I mean, we, when, when we used to design data centers, we used to have like 10 kilowatts per rack. I'm talking about 10 years ago. Today, mm -hmm. if we want to design a data center, we don't design anything for less than 30 kilowatts per rack, which is on the low side, by the way. Um, eBay was operating 60 kilowatt racks seven, eight years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. The Navy, the US Navy is operating 120 kilowatt racks. I don't know what they put inside, maybe bagel toasters, but I mean, anyways, 120 kW per rack. So the traditional cooling will not work. You will not be able to really manage the airflow. So what do you do? How do you deal with the heat and how, and how do you get the power? I mean, it's a problem. Well, we'll talk, we're talking about liquid cooling. We're talking about direct conduction cooling, which means you're just removing the heat by touching it by a certain fluid. Immersion cooling. I've seen few data centers that are dealing with the immersion cooling, but I think it's still a little bit. Uh, expensive the liquids the the uh, paos the pao liquids that we're using so far but I, the density is definitely going higher and higher and some I mean, at a certain point we will have a big problem managing heat right so we need to transition uh, the heat management process into an ai because otherwise um, the normal kind of because everything is changing in the data science. it's not something that is really stable it's like moving, fluctuating a lot. So you need something that will be able to manage all that while maintaining the, the efficiency. That's another part of the challenge, actually. Not right. only being able to manage it, manage it efficiently. That's uh, another thing, yeah. Well, Chris, can you talk about this at all, what, you, what Microsoft faces other than saying yes? <laughs> well, I think the pendulum continues to swing, right? Yeah. You mentioned, you know, edge computing was so important. Um, and I, th I still think, you know, it remains important. And, and I remember being on a panel, you know, uh, probably four or five years ago uh, and talking just strictly around edge computing. That doesn't take away the importance today. I, I think what we're, we're getting at is because of the need for high density computing, uh, those challenges of being able to construct that and bring what you need to do those densities in a data center is a challenge, uh, both from what Dickens talking about as far as how are you going to overcome that that heating problem, uh, you know whether it's liquid cool or or what have you, but then also something we haven't touched really on is the sustainability of that and the challenges globally around being able to provide something uh, for a data center that is ten to a hundred megawatts. How do you, how do you provide sustainable uh, energy? that is not impacting the, the global warming and, and the environment. And so that, that also is the challenge as, as we're moving forward as an industry, um, getting to those locations where governments are really paying attention to, to that scale now in moratoriums and permitting and different things like that, that is limiting our capabilities to be able to do sustainability um, with, with the traditional matters of diesel, en uh, diesel engines and, and, and such. So it, it's paying attention to all of that as the pendulum swings to the larger data centers, we're going to have to be uh, really mindful of how, how do we ensure the resiliency of those data centers right. through sustainability. Laurie, Laurie, can you answer Chris's question about sustainability? And what are your thoughts about um, the promise of edge 10 years ago compared to where we are today? And 
you agree that that's what it looks like we're doing is moving towards higher densities and bigger centers rather than rather than more distributed. Oh, I, absolutely. Because, you know, just like Keith said, right, we, we don't throw anything away. We just keep building more. And as we're trying to get, you know, hey, we can reach new markets. We can reach everyone in the world. You're expanding. You're like, oh, well, I can use Edge too. I can use Cloud too. I can use all of these. So the densities actually across are huge. And then yeah. in comes AI. And, right, they're building out, right, these are... This is a lot of compute that they need. They need right so bad they have to build new chips to handle it, right? And those are taking just as much power, right? So you're you're just going to have like it compounds over time, um, and the use of edge is is kind of leaning more toward like, right? It's it's CDN plus compute. I want to put my digital front end there or my IoT right collection point there, but I'm not actually deploying right my real apps there, if you will, right? My data center apps are not moving to the edge. They're just not, uh, but they are being used to kind of distribute things where it makes sense. So you are contributing right to building that out constantly. We, um, we've been doing some research on sustainability and we actually have an index that, that people can find if they go to the IDCA website and there's quite a broad range of uh, sustainable um, environments so to speak in the countries of the world so Carl you're in Europe the UK has uh, where your base has one environment uh, continental Europe has another uh, what sort of issues and thoughts do you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to sustainability and um, I assume that Bloomberg, like any organization, gets increasing amount, increasing amount of traffic, increasing amount of data. What does the sustainability question mean to to what you do? Uh, for us, we're, I mean, we we're not that heavy a user of power, not outside of the U.S. anyway. Um, so we don't. We probably won't fall into a majority of the reporting, I don't think, yeah. um, going forward. But we are, you know, be falling into numerous uh, or, you know, uh, different local legislations that might be coming about. Um, so from from my point of view, it's it's mainly it's reporting and the work that goes into reporting and answering all the questions that are coming out from different, um, you know, uh, lawmakers, um, green groups, whatever, however you want to class them. Um, you you can't really probably comment on whether you true thoughts on that, but I mean, you have to be aware at all moments. My, my impression is the European environment is more lively than the US and the sustainability efforts are going to be more pervasive. Um, so how much attention do you have to pay to that? A lot, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, we we see more of it coming from you know. I don't I don't have to probably keep an actual eye on it because the people will come to me, so yeah. the colos will come to me, so I will find out pretty quickly. You know, there's something coming up. We need this answer on on that, and right. you know why you can or can't or what you're doing. Um, so um, yeah, it's but we're we're starting to see that the, the talk. And uh, okay. luckily for me, I find it interesting. Well, that's, <laughs> that's always helps. Keith, um, uh, Keith just shot me a comment. He wants to, I, I think we're talking about uh, GPUs. I think we're talking about different data types that are uh, consuming more energy and that's driving density. And it's, um, what, what are your thoughts about density? It sounds like it may be a bigger issue even than we've said so far. Well, you're muted. You're muted again. I, I, I got to stop doing this. I got. I'm just going to leave myself off mute. Yeah, so we, we we have to put some meat behind this a little bit. A six U server with four NVIDIA A100s will take up 10k of power at mm -hmm. max at, at peak. So let's think about what that means. In a 42 or 50 U rack which is fairly dense, but I'm only limited at best to uh, uh, 30K of power and the most 
I think aggressive and and, and well positioned colos, the uh, three servers will or eighteen U will eat up all of your power. Let's go to the opposite end of that. Carl mentioned how connectivity is one of his biggest challenges in not just the EU, but across the U S is why a lot of us go to colos and hotelers. So I can be close to the cloud or I can be close to the edge. The edge is, has not gone away from the concept. AI is just AI marketing has just sub sub just taken all the air out of the, out of the room, but yeah. customers are not pulling back their edge initiatives. So I need these super low power uh, compute right next to the high power compute. How do as a data center operator, how do I maximize my power and cooling right. for these very diverse workloads? This is a real challenge. Then how do I surface that in kind of the, the problem space that we work at is how do I surface that as a API? to my customers. As Carl said, that the colos are coming to him with power concerns or audit and compliance issues. How do I get ahead of that? How do I make sure that I'm sending via API or whatever the request across diverse colos and private data center and cloud assets, the compliance data that I need to make sure one, that I can do capacity ma management, Etc. This is all coming together. We talked about the lack of talent, the lack of uh, power and cooling, and the complexity of really diverse workloads. Okay. I see that. We're going to take um, not a break, but relax a little bit here. We have some survey questions. And so we'd like uh, producers to, to put the sur first survey question up. It relates to what we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, Becky has joined us for the second half of our um, of our webinar today. Uh, her welcome, Becky. Thanks for uh, being able to join us today. Thanks, um, Roger. And her video looks a little odd to me. I thought I'd tell the producers that maybe it's okay for everybody else. Survey question one: Does your organization have an operations manual that effectively addresses day-to-day -day concerns? And thanks to our audience, um, you always are very, very quick in answering these. Oh, it's, uh, we've got a horse race going here. Um, so far, the yes is winning 60 to 40. And it looks like that's where we're going to end. So 62% of you are overconfident about the effectiveness of your manual is going to be my guess. That's a smart aleck comment. I think that... Um, 38% of it said it does not effectively address the concerns. It's actually good to know that the majority does have confidence in, um, in what's going on. As always, I'm sure we can all improve. Question two, I think, uh, let's put that up there now while we're at it. Are a majority of your operating personnel professionally trained? Um, IDCA, of course, is among the organizations that offers uh, certification, and you get to, you get to have DECRON. Uh, teach uh, live and online, uh, depending on, on where you are and what the particular uh, certification is. I also did want to mention our sponsor today, Janitska. Uh, and I knew I was going to pronounce it wrong. I have this fear. Janitza. Janitza. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I did it wrong. So we're going to try again. Now, Janitza Electronics, um, we're very happy that Janitza could uh, help sponsor this today. And uh, we appreciate it. And of course, we encourage all of our viewers to go visit their website. If you're not already doing business with them, um, you should consider it. The second question, are a majority of your operating personnel professionally trained? 56% say yes, 44% say no. That's about the same ratio as we had uh, relating to the operations manage, uh, manual. Let's do question three, and then we'll um, take a break. Is your organization Make sure that your team maintains the certifications. I got a minute here. Uh, Decron, could you talk about that a little bit? Because uh, certifications expire. Why do they expire? Why is it critical that, um, that people keep up to date? Well, it's very similar to any kind of certification that you gain. Like, for instance, if your uh, facility is certified for ISO 9000, is it there for a lifetime or will it, will it expire at the end of the day, right? So when it comes to 
data center certification, like when you're training people, basically you're training them for the for the recent trends and you know uh, whatever is happening in the data center environment. And you cannot really give them a certification that is indefinitely valid because they need to refresh. They need to see what's happening around them. Uh, they need to really be acquainted with the technologies that are out there. Uh, so that's why um, any certification that IDCA grants is for two years. And then they can extend it later on by uh, taking a short refresher course or eventually um, enroll to an, any other course. Uh, um, the only the only thing that doesn't expire with IDCA is when you when you reach the end of the uh, the, the chain, like when you are a DCA, you're certified data center authority. It yeah. means that you're like you're you're a master in your in your uh, you know field. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's the only certificate that will remain valid for a lifetime. Right. So. Yeah, and I took. I mean, it extends across the, the whole world. I I got certified by the FinOps Foundation, and it expires about a year ago. It expires in two years because things change. Uh, yeah. we, as everyone knows, if you're in the technology business, whatever you knew 18 months ago is is not as relevant. So, 68% have said that their organization does not make sure they maintain the certifications. So we had some optimism and majority saying they have confidence in the manual. Majority have said that in fact, they do uh, do a lot of professional training, but the majority also says they don't necessarily keep up with them. So we're gonna take a five minute break here for everybody. So get up, walk around, do what you need to do. Uh, we'll keep the, I'm not gonna mute myself. I may talk to the producers a little bit. Um, that's, that's deliberate just so you know. And then we'll formally get started again in about five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. And there's the screen. Now, is uh, want to ask the producers or anyone else who can see, is Becky's video okay? Because it looks odd to me. If, if we, um, if it's good, then we're gonna. It's a little bit blurry. It's like the contrast uh, needs to be better, I guess. Oh, okay. Now I've got what looks like an opaque screen over yeah over. it's uh it's not fully transparent yes you're right yeah i don't know what that is um, if our producer can you can speak with becky to make sure we're we're good with that we'll be back in a few minutes and um i see we have i believe um we'll have a banner or something for janitza to make sure that um the people can know about them as well so i think um the second half, I'm going to start talking to Becky, and I want to talk about security because there's a very relevant issue related to that. And I think we can we can move to that part of the conversation. So, Roger, I can see somebody uh, raising his hand from the attendees. Usually, we allow them to speak, or they need to send their question uh, in writing. Well, they can send, send the questions to us. Um, send the questions to us and we will try to address it and if for some reason we just can't get to your to your question or comment we will make sure that we follow up but yeah send a send it in i'll, I'll write something send it into the chat and um yeah thank you I'm going to mute for just a second here.
All right, five minutes is over. We can um, we can get started here. We'll um, get our video back here in a second, and then we'll um, we'll start in. Yeah, Becky's image is not good. But we're going to go ahead anyway. I can, I can come off of video. It's no big deal, Roger. It is yeah, okay. Why don't you do that? We'll, we'll start uh, officially here in about another minute. Um, That's good. Yeah, we want to hear your voice anyway. That's what <laughs> they have. You know, they want to see someone good looking, they can just look at me. Um, <laughs> not a problem. So the producers, we could uh, go ahead and return to putting everybody on camera and we'll get started here. Ah, are we all back? All but um, somebody. Oh, Becky, no, you're there. Okay, welcome back. Hey, we didn't lose anybody. Thank you so much for hanging in there. And um, first uh, half of our webinar, we spoke about operational details. We spoke about densities and and dealing with the heat and the and um, at some point, you know, costs come into consideration. But uh, that is going to lead to the second half. And we welcome Becky Wanta um, for the second half of our program. Is joining the gang here. She is a lot of direct operational experience from early days, which we all are familiar with early days. But more recently, uh, really over the last many many years of her career to serve at the CIO, CTO level of very large organizations, and including MGM International. And as Becky is no doubt aware, MGM has been in the news recently. <laughs> nothing, nothing like this ever happened on her watch. Let's make it clear, she's been gone from MGM for some time. What the, and you're, uh, she's actually in Las Vegas right now. What the heck is going on? What is, you know, is this the sort of thing I've also read that Caesars had the same thing and actually paid ransom uh, to get their access and data back. And it's probably happened to other organizations on the strip. What is going on? And is there anything uh, based on your experience that could have prevented it? Or are we in a new age where the, the criminals are ahead of uh, the good people? You know, I mean, the, the, you know, as you know, that's a con that conundrum, right? As you know, it's a constant battle to try to stay ahead. And I remember I was in several of my board meetings and when I was at, with MGM and my chairman would say, you know, are you are you sure we're secure? And I'd say, I, I, we're doing everything we can to be secure. But if you think I'm going to tell you with 100 percent exactitude that we're not breachable, you'll never get that me to say that because that just puts a red bullseye on your back and has everybody aiming for you. So in this particular scenario, and I think my esteemed colleague panelists would agree too, is a lot of industries think that, okay, I'm running a, a hotel or I'm running a gaming institution or I'm running a CPG firm. I'll now go run IT because how hard can it be? So they go in, they step into IT and they try to run it. But you know, this is like any other skilled discipline. You need to have the pedigree and understand technology to run technology firms, to run instant, to run divisions of organizations that are that are you know not technology. And so, in this particular case, and the the, the challenge you have too is we all know that the media can be extremely irresponsible or color the news the way that they need to to get their points across. So you always have to take some of that into consideration too. I would tell you that what's probably going on is a lot different than what's being conveyed, but nevertheless, it's very detrimental to a brand. And, you know, yeah. it, it, the, the other thing I used to say is just because you can't see you're being breached doesn't mean you're not being breached. Just that's the, that's not paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Is, exactly. Is and so I think that, you know, this is a, you know, this, this should never have happened is what my point of view. And, and you know, this sounds a little pompous because I'd say this could not, have, this would not have happened on my watch. And the reason is, is because first of all, technology is what I know and do. And so I understand that it's a continuous focus area to make sure that you're doing all the things that you can to protect the brand of the company that you represent because reputation risk 
is the kiss of death of a lot of firms. And what you've just now seen is a lot of consumers very concerned about how deep and wide this right. bre breach is. Um, Lori, have you written about this? I've, um, I used to uh, watch your tweets all the time, but I uh, completely non-politically, I found that platform is not delivering to me what it used to. So I am ignorant of anything <laughs> you may have said so far and have you and will you comment on this issue? Wow, on this specific issue, no. I tend to, I try to reserve judgment because, yeah. right, as, as Becky mentioned, right, there are things going on right behind the scenes. You don't, you don't know exactly, right, what's going on. So you hate to, to pass judgment. Right. In general, however, right, this is it, the norm is that you will be attacked, right? And the bigger the brand, the bigger the payout, right? Follow the money. That's where attackers are going. It's no longer about, defacing a website and you know getting your name up there hey i hacked that site right it's now about real money so yeah, right, not, uh, you've got to defend <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's normal to see that it's it's really it and it's not just i think what we did too is that we started to put everything into and keith mentioned this right gotta have apis into your your operational planes right you got to have APIs and consoles and it's all over. And we're not even thinking about security on that side. And too many times attackers are coming in through these kind of, you know, unseen venues. It's not the big flashy app that you have on your website. They're going in. They're like, oh, look, there's a console for operating X and they're going to go in that way. They know it's not protected because people haven't made that shift of going, I need to protect every way someone come in, could come in. If you've locked the doors, you've closed the windows, the next thing to worry about is the air ducts because we've all seen that movie. That's how they get in, you know, yeah. close it, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, I agree. I, I operate from the principle that I'm glad there was no Facebook or camera phones when I was in college. And um, when something bad happens, I usually just feel bad because it, it could happen to 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 all of us. And uh, Decron, I, I was curious in what we teach or what you know, what can companies do? You know, Becky said, you're never gonna be at 100%. Um, do you agree with that? How close can you get? What should companies do besides but generally from, being vigilant? And from the security perspective we're talking? Oh, yeah. Uh, even if you, if you bury a computer like, I don't know, 150 feet underground and, and pile it up with dust, people would still be able to access things. I mean, it's not, nothing is 100% secure at the end of the day. You mm -hmm. Basically, you strive to make sure, you know, uh, you strive to make sure that you're, you're, you're as secure as you can. Uh, the government has launched already the quantum security thing. You know, when the quantum computers will be launched tomorrow, what will be the security? You know, uh, how are we addressing that part of it? Even if we have heavily encrypted, you know, uh, documents or whatever have you, uh, the quantum computer will be able to decrypt that in a matter of seconds. I mean, they did a, a simulation and it it, it it turned out to be that, you know, 200 million years of computing with the super, the super powerful, the most, you know, powerful computer that exists today, that will take 200 million years to compute, whereas the quantum computer can do it in 20 seconds. So what are we doing now? Are we really preparing for that quantum era of security? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I think the AI will also factor into the security like the blockchain for instance a lot of uh, a lot of that blockchain even the blockchain is not that secure with quantum uh, computing uh, that we're you know eventually it will hit the markets uh, sooner or later right yeah i remember um i mean years ago someone said that you know locks on your house only keep your friends out well they keep right. vandal, you know they keep random vandals out too but the same thing with, with security, I want to ask Keith what his thoughts are on this in general, but one thing I'm struck about uh, is captures and all that kind of stuff for me personally, it just, it just confounds me. And I'm not the person you're trying to keep out. You know, the people that you're trying to keep out seem very capable of going way beyond any kind of security that you would impose on someone like me, who's just a user. Um, I, I had a site. What are your thoughts on that, Keith? Yeah, so we have to constantly continue to improve the practice. You know, just some stuff that was in the news from the MGM uh, hack 
no one should be accessing systems with uh, generally uh, generally accessing systems with an administrative account. That's just not good practice. Right. But the uh, the assumption is is that someone's already in your system. That's where you that should be the starting point. That someone is already there. And how do I recover? We practice in our lab recovery all the time. The thing that keeps me up at night is not necessarily being hacked, but having my ESXi servers uh, encrypted is a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, hackers are, you know, uh, the as Lori said, hackers are going through the air ducts. The I think it was uh, years ago, though. Uh, I, I don't know if it was Walgreens or, or Target or. That hack was through the uh, HVAC systems, literally through the HVAC systems. Yeah. So the with the idea that people are going to get in, you're going to have encryption. I've talked to customers. They're doing it. They are going through. Uh, this is where DR practices are actually paying, paying off. You may not be flipping over to new systems, but the recovery methodologies and the continued business operation uh uh, practices you go through actually have practical use when it comes to ransomware recovery. How do I, you know, have vaulted storage off prem that I can bring back in and restore back if my backup systems themselves, you know, people are going after the backup systems, encrypting the backup systems and compromising those systems. We have to, you know, kind of practice recovery worst case scenario. I'm, I'm curious, um, I'm going to ask Carl and then Chris, um, if you have any comments about this whole issue that you can say about what you do or your thoughts, and if you don't, that's fine. First, Carl, uh, what do you make of all this conversation? I, I honestly, I personally, I don't have really too much input into that area, so yeah. nothing, and if I say anything, Right, we'll just that's all go a, wrong. <laughs> Are you in a similar position? Uh, yeah, I ask Chris now. Sorry, I was buried in some of the open questions in the uh, in the chat. Uh, so if we're talking about uh, MGM and or CAPTCHA or anything like that, I think you know the. Let's go back to our conversation around AI and the improvements that that has on CAPTCHA. There's some really interesting stuff online that you can go look about what Google's doing. How dare I mention Google being a Microsoft employee? But mm -hmm. um, there, there, are, there are definitely things out there that are, you know, progressing in that area that uh, help the the general user from being able to access those things. But Keith yeah. nailed it, right? Um, and there's there's things around how those systems need to be accessed in a safe and secure way from protected systems, et cetera, so forth, that need to be followed. And this is really where I think the heart of our conversation is supposed to be around the operational security um, and those considerations. So it really starts with how you're accessing those things and making sure that um, you're, you're doing it in a secure manner uh, across all those different levels. Speaking of quantum computing, we got a question and I, and I see um, here the, the comments. Um, what cooling requirements are required? So we get back to cooling. Uh, to me, this is coming back to cost. So the, I, I'm going to put the question out, and 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 we can. Uh, I think I'll start with Dikron again. Is cost as big? A, this may sound like a dumb question, but I'm good at asking that kind of question. Is cost the consideration that it used to be? Meaning, do we have to get an, used to an era of increased cost for these data centers, while at the same time? at the financial level, uh, determining increased value that they're providing to the organization. Because it sounds like we're really going to have to enter a new era of, of increased costs. Well, I think, uh, Roger, we need to ask it differently. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we're not talking about the cost, but what would be the cost when the downtime happens, right? Mm -hmm. What would be your losses? I mean, you're putting cost into building the data center, operating the data center, but what would be the cost in case you lose your business, in case you have a data breach, in case you have a hacking scenario, in case you have something that went down? So definitely the cost has something to do. You need to have all the tools and all the uh, uh, professional people to manage the cost of the data center. Um, uh, the cost, I mean, sometimes, you know, you put the cost in, in one data center, 
and you put a lot of cost to increase your availability and uh, service availability and uh, you know business viability and whatever have you and you forget sometimes that you can manage it better and you can have a, a better data center by design by implementation when you diversify rather than putting all your eggs in one basket for instance when you diversify and today that's why people are you know having multiple data centers the cloud operators are operating multiple hundreds of data centers why because they need to have the resilience so putting the cost in one place is not really something that you can uh you know uh consider anymore and definitely you need to always manage your cost uh being efficient everything is competitive today you need to have a good understanding of your actual you know cost what would be what would be the the amount of money that you'll be you know, uh, losing in case anything happens to your business. Like when we asked the question to eBay, I remember like seven years ago, each second of interruption would cost them $1,500, $1,600 each second. So I'm sure Microsoft, Google, AWS, they have similar kind of, uh, you know, approach. Yeah, an approach to it. Um, I was going to ask Becky your thoughts on this, but first I wanted to, to Becky, mentioned that um, without naming names, she and I were actually involved with something a couple of years ago where we didn't get hacked, but a company with which we were doing business did. And it affected our traffic because we were embedded into that, into that company's infrastructure. And um, what do you make of all that? That had a kind of a negative effect on, on what we were doing. And, um, you know, from the CIO level, how do you deal with all this, Becky? Well, I mean, it's you've heard everybody, like you heard Lori and Keith both comment on, you know, um, letting have anybody have access to your 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 edge servers or your edge applications and, and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, from that perspective and where I where I've been, I would never allow someone to have that kind of access. You know, I mean, you heard Keith talk about. You know, when we set up different security topologies and everything, you set it up not into where there's a honeypot. There's all kinds of different ways to coordinate off and 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 basically isolate, remediate, and remove whatever is a bad actor. And we set we do all that. So the same thing is true with letting people through into different applications. So you always create a way to firewall yourself off from a, another attack. Because one of the things you know, when Deepron was talking about costs. One of the costs that is very difficult to quantify is the cost of reputation risk. When your mm -hmm. consumers lose confidence okay. in you, yeah. there's no that's the death knell. That'll kill a company. And and I had a joint venture with Microsoft early early on back when you know back when I was with Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. and this was a, a situation I think you all on the on the call here remember uh, Egghead Software. They had a security breach and that company went out of business. And so. You know, all of us in the industries that I've led, we're very, very particular about preserving our brand. So when if we are going to, you know, integrate with different things or like what Keith talked about or Chris talked about with regard to APIs and things like that, we make sure we've got that really tested all the way through the workflow to make sure that that there's not a bad actor that's that's attached to that that enters into the fray, because that's the job that we, that's the responsibility we take on. We have to be careful with all of that. But that also plays off with, you've got to be able to be very innovational. The answer can't be no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've heard that from you before. The answer can <laughs> be no. Uh, Lori, what do you uh, make of all this? So we've moved from, I started a simple question with, well, well, gee, they're running hotter, so you're gonna have to spend more on cooling. And we ended up talking about existential threats to the business that are running you out of business. So that's how bad it is. Do you agree with that? That's what we're talking well, yeah. about. Yeah, right. I, yes. I mean, operational excellence rate right, is all the way down to, you know, are we running this efficiently? What's the cost model, right? The heat, the sustainability, all the way up to, are we secure, right? Operational security is a thing as well. So you have to keep, right, moving up the stack and including all of that. Um, security shouldn't be added on after the fact, right? I've heard multiple things that all point to that concept of, of zero trust, least privilege, assume breach, everything is an asset, right? So, you know, how do you protect that? You know, how do you build something that's going to protect all of that from, right, the hardware all the way up to the software, the APIs, mm -hmm. right, the access. You, you, operational excellence has to kind of build that in. Right. You can't 
both right, times. exactly. Well, how do you answer Laurie's question, Keith? Uh, how do you answer Laurie's question? I'll let Becky speak again. But Keith, how do you answer that question? How do you make it not an add-on? How do you, you know, view the entire organization? Your customer, because you talk to people that I'm sure they're not always listening to you, or is it actually, do they ever listen to you? So security isn't a feature. It's not a bolt on. It's part of what we do. I have my most current rant is about, you know, kind of this AI washing most of the SaaS providers are doing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the AI opportunity, the gender AI opportunity from a vendor space perspective is as big, if not bigger than the public cloud. There is a gold rush there. We're watching SaaS providers last week at conferences saying, talking to business users about how they can use the uh, data within their uh, SaaS platforms to uh, create generative AI chatbots uh, and generative AI assets. And the reality, everyone on this webinar knows that's going to create new problems, hallucination, et cetera. I was at VMware Explorer a few weeks ago. Very first speaker on there was the general counsel talking about data security and the complexity of generative AI and AI in general. Right. These are things that are fundamental to how we should be thinking about building new systems. Uh, we should be looking at tooling, whether ironically, to make this a little circular, AI tooling inside of our applications as we're building applications, there should be throughout the whole CI, uh, uh, CD stack, the whole pipeline security checks to make sure that we're not uh, developing code with holes in it from a security, uh, from a physical security perspective, just the basics, making sure we log entry, that we have strong security, uh, dual factor authentication. So many of the basic things we're not doing. I posted this to Twitter the other day and one of my industry colleagues pushed back on me and said, Keith, we're not training our staff to, to, to do these things. You know that. You know that you shouldn't be using your administrative credentials to create Word documents. But do the average, you know, does the average born in the cloud person know that yeah. educational programs, et cetera, security is a, is a, is an integrated part of what we do, not, you know, kind of an afterthought. How do I, how do I secure my environment? Well, if you're asking that question, you're probably too late. Yeah. So we're going to move on to the survey here in a minute, but first, um, and as I mentioned to everyone at the, at the top of this program, we are going to run a little bit long, which is great. Um, so it'll be a few more minutes. So hang in there, everyone. And Becky, I interrupted you. What were you going to say as a follow up to Lori? What I was going to say is, you know, there, there's a fundamental step here that needs to be taken. And, and I think it's becoming more top of mind, but it's almost analogous to back in the days of quality, you know, with quality always gets tested at the end of the app, which is a ridiculous approach, right? Versus baking it in from the fundamental design all the way through. Well, security has to be now to address the same exact way. Your security engineer should be at the table with your development teams, your architect and everything as you're building applications. So security is being baked in all the way through. And again, I'll come back and say, no is never an answer. And from a technology perspective, and the reason I say it this way is, it's all about driving business revenue, right? So the intellect of what we bring from the technology perspective is how do you do that in a safe, secure kind of way when your goal is to make sure your companies continue to be either number one in their market or attain number one in their market. That's the role we play as the CIO and we have to balance that risk. So I'm just saying the fundamental step to everybody on this webinar and on this panel is get the security into the applications you're building day one. Don't do it as an afterthought. Don't do it as a plug-in. Don't do it as an add-on because every one of those are vulnerabilities. As long as we have a world where we have endpoints, we have on-ramps. Ah, well, Be real as, about it. as long as we have a world that has endpoints and bad actors, so it's kind of happened. So I wanted to um, move to the, to the, our survey again. So if we could bring up Question four, and meanwhile, I, I did want to thank our sponsor, Yanitza. I'm, I'm going to pronounce it correctly eventually. I'm speaking in the German way. They are based in Germany, but it's Janitza Electronics. And we are glad that Janitza could uh, help sponsor this webinar today. So thank you. Also want to draw attention to, we do these webinars every month. 
third Wednesday of the month, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And next month, that'd be October 18th. We're gonna talk about uh, managing digital infrastructure in government. Uh, government, as you may know, is a large market. You may know that there's uh, quite a concentration of data centers in the federal government area of the United States. Um, I think it was something like 40% of all the data centers in the, in the country are there. Um, so it's a, it's a big, big topic and we're gonna be talking about it then. You can also look at our schedule and see we're going to be talking about sustainability, focusing on that in November, and we're going to be focusing on AI in December. So eventually we can get around to everything. Could we see the survey? Number four, I think we're up to. See if that'll come up. Ah, here we are. What is your, what is your root cost of downtime? And human error takes the early lead. We'll see if that's gonna, can I end up being it? We have, uh, well, everyone can see what the choice is, but for our uh, panelists, human error, lack of budget, old infrastructure, connectivity, or a power outage. And guess what, human, I, I don't wanna tip the poll, but I think human error is gonna win this one. I have a, I have a very good feeling about that. Unfortunately, yes, Roger, I agree with you. That's it's uh, probably it intuitively is. and experientially everybody is going to agree with that. Sixty percent of said human error is uh, uh, is the main reason for for downtime. And the interesting thing is nobody said lack of budget. Yes, so it's not a matter of budget. If we could, um, that's that's um, that validates, I think, what what everyone is is really thinking. And then power outages, but. Uh, those happen. That's why you back up. Let's move on to the next question. Um, do you have an effective equipment lifecycle and capacity management regime in place? And this is the old thing of trying to plan for the future. Uh, Dikra, if you could comment a little bit on that, because you're, as everyone's aware, um, I could ask anyone this, but Dikra, if you could, you're going after a moving target, capacity planning. Short-term data and long-term, how many data centers you got? You know, how do you how well, do you have an effective equipment lifecycle and capacity management regime? Well, how do you do that? The thing is, you know, the capacity management is always a big challenge for uh, operators. You know, um, managing what capacity? Everything is interconnected at the end of the day. Uh, the only way today, uh, the complex environment data centers to manage the capacity is to have the vis visibility to trend for the capacity demand. And that requires a lot of, you know, a lot of tools, a lot of sensors, a lot of, you know, uh, data collectors so that you see how your, your capacity is moving forward. It's not something, you know, by the magic rod, you need to increase your capacity today and tomorrow your capacity will be increased. That will never be, happen. So basically the capacity management is a long kind of uh, trend that you need to look at. You need to look at your past trend. You need to look at your future demands. You need to be able to correlate all the events, like for instance, I'll give you an example. If your CPU activity, increased CPU activity, is it really affecting your UPS output or is it really affecting your network connectivity uh, kind of, uh, you're having any bottlenecks when you have CPU activity or when you have additional transactions. So basically having that visibility. And today, uh, most of the DCIM solution providers are you know, trying to sell you additional modules and one of the modules capacity management so trying to manage the capacity along with the dcim solution that you have that looks at, uh, at all your different silos bring them together and gives you a better visibility as to how you can manage right. your capacity so we have 56 percent have said yes to that question 44 percent no uh let's bring up question six if we could and then carl um if you could comment too on capacity planning and management how do you address that issue at, uh, at bloomberg with what you do Do you want me to do that now? I can yeah. Do that. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we we use we use our own DSIM package that we've created ourselves. So, um, we we tailor that to what we require. But we uh, we spend a lot of time looking at, at you know the, the numbers and and how much space we need. Luckily for us, we sort of do the same thing over and over again so it's very cookie cutter so 
-hmm. you know what works for one will work for them all you know the, the numbers don't change so much so it's it's easy to um know what happens more right. or less globally if if something changes so um well, well i'm curious with chris how, do, how does that affect what you know your world at, at, at microsoft maybe not the entire organization but but your world no, I think historically, uh, lifecycle and decom tends to take a back seat by everybody because it's running. Uh, I think Keith was talking about, have you ever seen a base server? It's been there forever and it's never going away. I mean, you you run across those instances all the time because finance doesn't want to spend the money um, and, and stay up to date on the latest technologies. And then trying to manage a certain amount of capacity so you have the turn space or you have the, the area in your data center that you can do those life cycles is also a challenge because you don't want to strand capacity that's stranded money as well. So it's a, it's a never ending struggle. I mean, at, at Microsoft, we, we do a better job of that, I think, than, than where I've been previously. Uh, but at the same time, it's still a, a conversation that needs to be held on a regular basis to make sure you're, you're staying up to date on the latest technologies. You're ensuring that you have, uh, those capabilities inside your data center to to be able to refresh and move those things along uh, uh, accordingly. What are your thoughts on that, Lori? Well, I think it's a good idea. You should do it. Um, absolutely. Okay. No, I I think there's right there's there's so many different facets to right capacity management. Do you have enough right down to cycles? Do I have enough bandwidth? Do I have and then for what right? I want a new app, I want a new thing, I want to expand, right? It, everything is going to add, right, different pressure onto your infrastructure. And you have to figure out what that means at the from the bottom of the stack, we're powering cooling and, and cycles and bandwidth and right all the way up to, you know, the very top. How many more people could I reach with this? And then what are the costs, right? And try and balance all of that. It's It's difficult. What, what do you, Becky, um, and I'll, we'll, we'll let Becky have the last word here because she's going to want to anyway. Uh, <laughs> everybody, we're, we're good friends. Becky, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, capacity planning and what if you're running out and how do you address this issue so it permeates through the organization and you don't have big mistakes? So, so let's, let's, let's baseline here. So mm -hmm. IT budgets represent one to 6% of gross revenues to a company. So when you when you when you hear Chris talk about where you know it's a constant fight, do I do this upgrade? It doesn't pencil out because you get your your bean counters talking about ROIs and a lot and a lot of this stuff, candidly, folks, may not have an ROI when you embark on it. But in the reality of the business environments that I've led, we never turn anything off. So if you never turn anything off, I mean, we all all talk about sunsetting. The only thing that's that happens that works in your behavior is most of the time of we've got a five year refresh strategy on our equipment and our data centers. So by definition, that means I'm turning 20, I'm refreshing 20% year over year. But let's talk about that one to five, one to 6% of gross revenues. In the IT budget space, and this is important for all of you because you're service providers too, as well as the people attending this webinar, 80% of that money is already spoken for in terms of licensed labor and maintenance. You're leading companies that have to stay number one in their game. So you've got 20% yeah. to do innovation. So one of the things that I always do when I transform companies is move that metric. So I've got 50 or 60% of fixed spend and 40 to 50% of invariable spend, which is where I get to drive the innovation. But a lot of what we're talking about today when we talk about capacity planning, it all puts a big burden on the system when you never turn stuff off. Okay. And so... Go ahead. So turn it off. I learned that in FinOps too. That was one of the you, you take this long instruction and the and one of the big lessons is turn <laughs> turn stuff. it off. Turn I'm it sad. off. Um, so we have a topic for another webinar. We're we're running out of time here, and I apologize, everyone, if uh, we didn't uh, let you get all your thoughts in and for questions that we couldn't address. I did uh, want to say on uh, the question, and please, uh, there's only one right answer to this last question, please get it right. And uh, the sixth question had to do with business continuity. And 93%, 93% said that they are not 
um, confident in the business continuity plans of their organization. So there's uh, that was kind of underlying everything we talked about today. And now we have an explicit topic for a new webinar. Uh, the question seven was, do you feel like this webinar was informative and helpful? And yes, once again, 100% of the people have said yes. Let's close the poll before, uh, before we ruin that. No, we really appreciate everyone that's been able to attend uh, today. I appreciate all the panelists uh, coming here. And I want to stress again to everyone watching that please feel free to contact any of these people with any questions that you have. They're here. Uh, they're interested in talking to you. And we want to, to be able to go as deep as we can. Uh, one more uh, thank you to Janitza, who's been our, our sponsor today, Janitza Electronics. Again, visit our website to learn more about certification, learn more about future webinars. And with that, I think we're going to go. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we'll look forward to speaking to all of you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.